This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twim. From Microbe TV, this is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 137, recorded on October 13th, 2016. This episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream, a subscription streaming service that offers over 1,500 documentaries and nonfiction series from the world's best filmmakers. Get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month. And for our audience, the first two months are completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the promo code microbe. This episode is also brought to you by Drobo, a family of safe, expandable, yet simple to use storage arrays. Drobos are designed to protect your important data forever. Visit drobo.com to learn more. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIM the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Well, hello there. How hello have you everybody. been? E everything well? Yes, indeed. Things well, are fine in San Diego. San Diego, always 72 and sunny. Well, sort of. <laughs> Here we're moving into winter, I think. The trees are turning. Also joining us from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello. How have you been? Great. It's beautiful here in Michigan where the leaves are starting to turn. We get yeah. that, those clear, sunny days. It's wonderful. You like that? I do. And your football team is doing great. So, congratulations. Six there. and oh. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Impressive. Also, joining us from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. And you've survived Matthew. We survived, Matthew. We saw much, much rain. We had between 8 and 12 inches of rain, depending upon where you lived in the low country. And we saw the loss of many, many trees. And university had water up to the porch, as they say, around many of its, its buildings. Fortunately, the porch is often 8 feet off the ground. And the storm surge is what was really most frightening. My old graduate student is now the chief physician for the pediatric emergency room, and he was out along with his residents taking photographs during the peak of the storm surge. And there's one bay where they receive patients that's literally eight feet off the ground, and uh, it was completely flooded. The only way you could get to it was by boat. No, it it was a, it was an incredible. But fortunately, the water is gone. We have, as they say, chamber of commerce weather here in Charleston today. No humidity, about <laughs> seventy five degrees, and it is absolutely spectacular. But I have to give our governor Nikki Haley credit. She pulled the trigger on Tuesday of last week and said we are going to evacuate. She reversed both lanes of the interstate. So it was all leaving town and it was orderly and quick and the university was closed from Wednesday through uh, Monday and uh, we came through it pretty well. I was here through Thursday. We buttoned up everything in the lab and, and dealt with everything that we needed to do. And then I bugged out <laughs> to go off to this meeting we're going to hear about in the snippet to Elio's hometown of beautiful San Diego. And everything Elio says about the weather is true. Well, you left the hurricane to go to California. That was smart. Yeah, 3,000 miles. I figured the storm surge is going to have <laughs> to get across the Rockies to get to me. So we'll hear you tell us a little bit about that meeting. Yes. In your snippet. But before we do that, uh, one of our colleagues passed away recently, and Elio is going to tell us a little bit about him. Well, this is Fred Neidhardt, who microbiologists will recognize as one of the leading lights in the study of growth physiology of bacteria, uh, the author of a two volume book, which is now in uh, on the internet, called, uh, colloquially called the E. coli Bible. Then he originated it and was the editor-in-chief of it. And Fred was also, he was at the University of Michigan, as Michelle's uh, 
abode. And there he was uh, chair of the Department of Microbiology, associate dean of the medical school, and vice president for research. And the remarkable thing is for somebody who has done that much administration, he was still much beloved. (laughs) (laughs) That takes some doing. And uh, he was just a great human being. Um, He uh, had a very deep commitment to social issues, minorities, women. Uh, He dealt with the, he retired to Arizona, where he dealt with the injustice in the prison system and the treatment of migrants. So he was really a man involved in a spiritual sense, if you wish, in a social sense, way beyond what most scientists are. And his contribution to science was terrific. I want to read you a quote, that, what he wrote, uh, which explains a little bit his interest in growth physiology. He said, intrigued by growth as the unique property of living systems, I was captivated upon first observing early on in graduate school the speed, efficiency, and adaptability of the growth of bacterial cells such as Escherichia coli. I resolved to learn all I could about how cells grow and to do so by exploring the physiology of bacteria. Now, he and I have been, John Ingram did a number of books, and more recently, Michelle and he and I and uh, him, Marighera, uh, did a book called Microbe, a textbook for undergraduates. And his ability to get to the point, as exemplified by this quote, was evident throughout. I will miss him very much. He was a very dear, perhaps my best friend. And if I could just echo some of the things that um, Elio said. Um, when I first started my lab here, my first student, Brian Hammer, was fortunate to take a bacterial physiology class from Fred. So Fred was still active in many ways in the department. And it was there that Brian learned about Magic Spot, about PPGPP, which is a small molecule that coordinates the stringent response. And it's fair to say that that session in class really became a cornerstone for the research in my lab on a pathogen, Legionella pneumophila. So Brian Hammer um, uh, took that observation and ran with it, had a a couple of nice publications. Later students, Zach Delabro, Rachel Edwards, uh, continue this line of work. And I I, I credit Fred with um, that insight, which allowed us then to share with the pathogenesis community the importance of bacterial physiology and how that dictates when microbes uh, will turn on their virulence factors. So I think it, it was um, a contribution to the new field that, it, in fact, we're going to learn more about today in the paper, the impact of bacterial physiology on um, pathogenesis. So Fred was just a wonderful colleague and an inspiring uh, team teacher to me and to my students. Was he your chair when, when you came he there? He was not. He had already stepped down. Mm-hmm. Okay. Or stepped up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's right. But his, um, the, the philosophy and the culture that he set up here in the department continues to this day. So we're known for having a very um, flat structure. So we have, for example, students and postdocs represented at our faculty meetings. And um, we... Uh, care very much about the training aspect, and that is in large part to the uh, culture that Fred established while he was chair, and and that you too, Elio, established at Tufts. I, I credit both of you with that. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, before we move on, by the way, last week I wrote a blog post on the Nobel Prize in Medicine for Autophagy by Yoshinori yeah. Osumi and Michelle. I was reading. If you go to the uh, Nobel site, you can find basically a, a review article that was written by people at the Karolinska in support of this uh, award. And they cite your, your early work on autophagy. Ah, yeah. Yeah. And I want to point out that um, most of their work was done with baker's yeast. Mm-hmm. So it's a beautiful example of how we can use mm. model organisms with great genetics and then identify pathways that are relevant throughout the uh, animal kingdom, but including humans. And now we appreciate that many, not only infectious diseases, but many other diseases um, are really can be traced back to whether autophagy is working well or not. It's a great story that at the time, the early 90s, we didn't really understand autophagy. We had no markers. We had no genes or proteins. And That's right. Uh, Osumi decided to study it in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. It just he, broke the field wide open. And he identified 
15 genes and that's it. And he found them also in mammalian cells. And that was the beginning. And this is a, therefore a really, really well-deserving Nobel, but also an example of how I mean, he was curious. He wanted to see, he didn't know what it meant. He just wanted to figure it out. And that's uh, how good science really proceeds. Yeah, I think that's, it's important to emphasize that. With no specific intent. No, nope. I mean, no, I mean, there that's was the no thing. machine he was going to make or no drug or therapy. It was just because he was curious. Exactly. Exactly. And that, you know, we're, we kind of are moving away from that these days, but, this, this prize emphasizes why it's important to let people just be curious. Yeah, and autophagy has implications for cancer, for um, aging, for yep. infectious disease. It covers many different um, clinical yep. syndromes. So it's, it's a fabulous uh, selection yep. for the prize. Yep. And now I use a Ronald Reagan quote to, for Michelle. Now there you go again, pointing out how curiosity-driven science can do good things. Mm. You can, the more we point it out, well, you can't point it out too much because it's yeah. really important. All right, Michael, you went to a meeting in San Diego. Give us a snippet on this meeting. The meeting was entitled The Fourth Recent Advances in Microbial Control, and it was sponsored by the Society for Industrial Microbiology and Biotechnology. So this is a meeting that I hadn't ever been to before, but I'm going to tell you, this was well worth the trip to San Diego. It was a fantastic meeting. It was comprised of uh, principally plenary sessions by leading researchers in the field looking at the advances in microbial control. And as I sat there going through the meeting, I kept writing next to the titles in the program TWIM. I think we, we have to tell people about these things. So I'm only going to share with you the opening session, the keynote talk that was delivered by Bill Fenical, who is an investigator at the University of San Diego, California, and also the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. And he kicked everything off uh, at Sunday morning at 10 a.m. And his title was a title of his talk was Microbial Defenses, Lessons from the Sea. And to make the long story short and to give you the bottom line up front, he introduced us to prospecting the ocean for new antimicrobials and new anti-cancer drugs. This is an individual who has gone out. He's been an oceanographer since the 70s. It's one of these classic examples like We've been talking about with the Nobel. He he was given a nine-month appointment at Scripps and said, do something. And he had to prove himself. And, and starting in the early 70s, he went out scuba diving, collecting samples. And now he has over 20,000 cultures of organisms harvested from the sea that actually can make various antibiotics and actually – begin to define the microbial world of the ocean. And remember, the uh, ocean covers 70% of our globe. Go ahead, Elio. Uh, quite a few are in the, from the sediment, aren't they? Which is a massive yes. amount of biomass. Yes, so, and I'm going to... Not just to the that. water column. Oh, no, this is not the water column. He showed this gadget. This is, And I'll just jump to the head here because Elio brought it up. He showed this wonderful gadget a sampling device and Scripps has this great machine lab and he had to make a machine lab. And so it would go down and sample the sediment at between 6,000 and 7,000 meters. And he would bring up microbial samples. And I know I, those of you out there are saying, well, what about the pressure and aren't the bacteria going to explode? And his answer is he didn't care. He would just culture whatever he could culture. And, you know, some of the proteins are being at 500 atmospheres, of course, are pressure sensitive and they have remarkable physical structures. And he showed us images and he he described wonderful things. But the sampling device that he had, it was weighted with a chain. And when the device hit the bottom, because gravity is pulling it down, when it hit the bottom, it because of the. Uh, sinking effect, it injected itself into the sediment, it grabbed a sample, and then 
it released the counterweight, which was this iron chain, and the sample would go back up to the surface for the po- folks in the boat to recover the sample and they could get the microbes. Mm. And so the way he introduced people to this topic was really pretty remarkable. He he pointed out to us that we aerobes, we terrestrial beings really have it pretty easy. When you think about it, we walk around effectively in a sterile environment. You know, we're really not fighting off bacteria in the air to the same level and extent that living things in the sea, and this could be anything from the plants that are in the ocean to the phytoplankton in the ocean to the fish. They're actually the concentrations of bacteria and viruses and fungi in the sea are often a million per mil for the bacteria. And remember, the ocean is is pretty dilute. And viruses at 10 to the 5 to sometimes higher, depending upon where they are in location to nutrients and, of course, fungi. And so we first introduced the audience to these remarkable uh, relationships between shrimp eggs and the bacteria that actually coat the egg. And so the shrimp lays its eggs and they're immediately coated with this remarkable bacterium that's actually an, an epiphyte that actually lives on the egg. And it's an Altermonas species. And he did a series of experiments in the mid 80s early 90s, where he began to characterize the altermonas. And it turns out that the altermonas produces a small molecule that's actually antifungal. And when he treated the shrimp eggs with penicillin, which would kill the bacteria that were attached to the egg, and he put them back in seawater, they immediately rotted. The eggs were all dead from the inherent fungi that are in the sea that would literally attack it. So it turns out that this microbe is making an indolinodilione, which they termed isatin. And it's, it's really remarkable. And as he began to get into the meat of the talk and began to reveal how many remarkable Uh, creatures he's been pulling out of the sea that are making polyketide and non-ribosomal peptide antibiotics and began to do the fundamental molecular biology behind these products and how they're actually being controlled. And I, I put one of the papers that was published in PLOS up in the show notes, and I'm going to plead that we come back and, and do that as a a proper paper because these polyketide antibiotics and these non-ribosomal peptides represent one of the largest class of largest classes of marine microbial natural products with very important clinical and the reason they do these things it's it's from an ecological impact and the structures and the fundamental organic chemistry that the microbes are doing is just so remarkable. And there's a wide variety of anti-cancer molecules that he's actually characterizing from all of this work of natural prospecting. His curiosity is literally delivering these new compounds to the market. And The questions that the audience asked him, well, since you found all of these remarkable things and you're able to grow them, why isn't Big Pharma beating a path to your door? Mm. We desperately need antibiotics. And, you know, he shrugged his shoulders and he said, it's it's all about economics because, you know, it takes so much money to take a drug from the bench top all the way to a clinical trial, but he actually has two compounds and an active clinical trials right now. So it was really a great way to start a conference and the topics that the conference went through, and there were seven plenary sessions and his, his session was in natural products for microbial control. So we learned a lot about prospecting, 
both in the aquatic world and the terrestrial world, where they're still actually discovering new antibiotics out there. So all hope is not lost. It it was really pretty neat to see what was going on. The other areas that they went through in this conference were next generation technologies to track and control pathogens. And one of the individuals from Penn State got up and his name was Dr. Knabel. And he talked about these pathogen harbors where listeria hides in these processing plants. And while you may Mm. disinfect them, the listeria literally are hiding in the safe harbor where the disinfectant can't reach. And then they come back or they're constantly recontaminating. And those of you who are addicted to Bluebell ice cream probably know about listeria and Bluebell. It's back in the news again (laughs) with another listeria outbreak. And he was talking about these safe harbors and the processing of our food and introduced us to all sorts of interesting topics. So the conference was a mixture of really industrial applications of very applied, but very practical. The The molecular biology that's going on, the modeling that's going on, it was like a mini ASM meeting in four days in beautiful San Diego. And I just took note after note and going, you know, slow down. I want to ask so many questions. It was just, (laughs) it was just, I, I felt like a new graduate student all over again. I was so excited just to, to listen to this. And I, I put the, the topics up. And one of the most interesting sessions was the emerging technologies and microbial control of industrial processes in energy production. And this is the microbiology associated with fracking. And some of the things going on there, it's a project, one of the scientists from Ohio State, an individual from Manchester, England, who's now on faculty as a young assistant professor at Ohio State, just gave this great story. And so, as Elio often says, stay tuned. And I'm going to make some pleads that we can bring some of these great papers because much of what was reported on what was um, has been in, published already. And it's a, it's a topic area that we really haven't touched much on in, in our TWIM. So I'm going to uh, make my plea for bringing some of these cool things to the TWIM audience. That just sounds great. Send them along. Michael, your remarks remind me of something else hopeful, which was last um, in September on the 21st, the president of the United Nations General Assembly convened a meeting at UN headquarters on the topic of antimicrobial resistance. So there's greater recognition that this is really a global problem and we need cooperation by not only pharmaceutical industry, but also governments across the world to improve our surveillance and best use practices of antibiotics as another strategy to address the problem. Absolutely. And and I just, just before TWIM this afternoon, I was over at the infectious disease grand rounds and the individual was talking about vancomycin and all of the challenges associated with vancomycin. And as part of his opening statement, he said vancomycin was isolated from a microbe that was collected from a soil sample from Borneo. (laughs) And he then asked the young residents and medical students in the room, okay, where's Borneo? And then he (laughs) showed a beautiful map and he said, you know, we need to do this prospecting. We need to look because, you know, vancomycin was described by Eli Lilly in the mid 50s, 60 years ago. Mm. And and so consequently, we really need to get busy and begin to take advantage of these things. Yeah, but I, I do think that the, the what you said earlier illustrates this, the point a little bit better. The amount of sampling that's been done on soils is humongous. Oh, yeah. I think that's been exhausted, and people believe that. So it's when people come in with sampling new habitats, like marine sediments, that are going to find some pay dirt. It's not likely that going back to Burma is going to help. That's been done. No, believe you're me, absolutely it's been correct. Done since, since 
be, about the end of the Second World War. I was involved in that. I lived in Ecuador and I worked in a company and the, a, a British company contracted us to send samples every of soil every week in a little, in a little uh, container, like a film cartridge. And so that kind of stuff has been done into the ground. It's looking for new habitats where you're going to find something new. Mm. Yep. You're absolutely right. And there's, you know, 70% of the globe is buried in water. So we That's should right. start hunting. Right. I have That's a colleague right. here at Michigan, David Sherman, who's also a diver. And he ah. goes prospecting mm. and brings his students to collect samples from exactly what you said, Elio, from um, new habitats to study the microbes and, and novel pathways that we That's might great. exploit. Yeah. All right. Beautiful. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. This episode is sponsored by Curiosity Stream, the world's first ad-free nonfiction streaming service with over 1,500 titles and 600 hours of content. It was founded by John Hendricks of Discovery Channel. So you're guaranteed to have real science shows, not reality TV that you can find everywhere else. You can get it on many platforms, including the web or any of those devices you may have that interface uh, the internet with your TV, like the Apple TV or iOS uh, device. You could do it from your iPhone, of course, Chromecast, Amazon Fire, or Kindle, and you can get it in 196 countries worldwide. They have a wide variety of nonfiction content, including science, technology, nature, history, interviews, lectures. Uh, I'm looking at the science section here. I just went to the front page and searched for science, the health of our oceans, miracles of nature, science shorts. Take a few minutes to learn more about subjects ranging from genetics to cyborgs, short pieces. There are 23 of those so far. Can we believe the science? Professor takes a hard look at evidence. The science of walking with beasts, miracles of nature, and so much more. I have in Stephen Hawking, of course, his uh, universe series where he traces the history of ast astronomical theories and a lot more that I think you'll really enjoy. They also have a very, very large 4K library that's super high resolution. They have over 50 hours of 4K content. They have monthly and annual plans available starting at two ninety nine a month, less than a cup of coffee. So it's really nothing to explore this interesting content. Check out curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the promo code microbe during sign up to get unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series. And that's completely free for the first 60 days, two entire months free of one of the largest nonfiction 4K libraries around. Just go to curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the offer code microbe at sign up. We thank curiosity stream for their support of twim. All right. I have a cool paper to tell you about, which was just published uh, last month in science and it's called virulence factors enhance citrobacter rodentium expansion through aerobic respiration. And this is just a lovely paper that ties together bacterial pathogenesis with physiology as as Michelle hinted earlier, it's just beautiful. It makes you want to go back and learn the Krebs cycle again, because <laughs> this is why it matters. And, and that's it, high praise. <laughs> that's high praise. <laughs> this is from uh, the, the Department of Microbiology at UC University of California, Davis, and Microbiology at University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. First author is Christopher Lopez. The other authors are Miller, Rivera, Chavez, Velasquez, Bindlos, Chavez, Arroyo, Loken, Solis, Winter, and Andreas Baumler is the senior author who was on TWIM many years ago uh, talking about similar work. And this is all about understanding how in people, uh, although they use a mouse model, everyone's heard of the different pathogenic strains of E. coli Entropathogenic E. coli, EPEC, entrohemorrhagic E. coli. One of their fundamental properties is that they these bacteria can adhere to your intestinal mucosa. Every and, everybody's heard of this as a microbiologist. Vincent. You think that, that other people haven't? <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you know, E. coli is a is a is a normal part of your gut flora, but in some cases you can acquire a pathogenic form. We actually talked about that when we were in uh, at, at uh, University of Michigan, because your chair there, um, Michelle, works on a 
form of E. coli that causes urinary tract infections. We talked a little bit about that. Occasionally, they can cause uh, gastroenteritis, and they're called EPEC or EHEC. And these have the ability to attach to your mucosa and damage it. It's called attaching and effacing. And when they attach, they cause a reorganization of the actin cytoskeleton of the host cells. These are the the, um, epithelial cells lining your gut tract. And it makes a pedestal-like extension of epithelial cells beneath the bacteria. And this is called an attaching and effacing lesion, an AE lesion. Now, the virulence factors that are needed to make these lesions are encoded by a pathogenicity island in the bacteria called the locus of enterocyte effacement, or LEE. And the genes here include genes that encode an adhesin, which is called intamin, which is important for adhesion, and a type 3 secretion system. And and these are just some of the genes encoded in this island. And this type 3 secretion system injects, among other things, the intamin receptor into the host cell, and that allows the bacteria to attach to them. Now, in this paper, they use a bacterium called Citrobacter rodentium to understand the pathogenesis of AE, attaching and effacing pathogens. This is a pathogen of mice, Citrobacter rodentium. In fact, it's the only known uh, attaching and effacing pathogen to naturally infect mice. And it's the only Citrobacter species with the LEE, locus of enterocyte effacement, uh, in its genome. So it's a model organism for studying the pathogenesis of E. coli strains that infect people like the EPEC and the EHEC strains. Okay. Now, what happens when you feed mice Citrobacter rodentium CR? They bind to the epithelium of the gut, causes attachment and effacement. And then the bacteria. This is the large intestine, isn't it? In this model, it's the large intestine, exactly. Then the bacteria expand. They, they multiply like crazy in the lumen after they've attached and caused this damage to the uh, epithelium of the gut. The type 3 secretion system is needed for this expansion of the bacteria. So if you, if you disrupt it by taking genes away from the, T, the type 3 secretion system, you don't get this expansion. However, in germ-free mice that don't have bacteria in their intestines, there's no effect of removing this type 3 secretion system. So the this is previous data, which led the authors to their hypothesis that somehow the type 3 secretion system creates a microenvironment in the gut that provides a growth advantage to the citrobacter over the resident microbes. All right, because if you take away the resident microbes in germ-free mice, it doesn't matter to this strain and it doesn't depend on type 3 secretion anymore for it to grow. So this paper, they're trying to figure out what is this advantage that the bacterium makes in the gut. So first... They want to know if the host, you know, when the, when the bacterium infects the host and damages the colonic epithelium, there's an inflammatory response of the host. There's a repair response where the host tries to fix the damage. And that leads to what's called colonic crypt hyperplasia. It's just a lot of multiplying of the epithelium lining uh, the gut tract. And they're wondering if this hyperplasia allows the citrobacter to grow by anaerobic respiration. In other words, making energy without oxygen. So you, you, you have an electron chain to produce energy, but the terminal acceptor is not oxygen. It's some other molecule like sulfate or nitrate or sulfur. And it's, not as, it's not as efficient as oxygen, but under some conditions, obviously, if there's not oxygen around, you have to be able to do that. Now, the respiratory, the enzymes called respiratory reductases that bring electrons to these other non-oxygen substrates like nitrate and other chemicals they have a cofactor required for the activity called molybdopterin. It's a three-ring molecule with a number of side chains. But basically, this is needed for uh, anaerobic respiration. So they make a citrobacter strain that lacks the gene necessary or a gene necessary to make this molybdopterin. In other words, will no longer be able to do anaerobic respiration. So mice that are then inoculated with a mixture of this mutant and wild-type citrobacter. And then you ask, who grows better? And basically, these mice develop intestinal inflammation. And when they recover bacteria from the colon contents, you see more wild-type citrobacter than the mutant bacteria. So there's an advantage of wild-type. When you take away the ability to do anaerobic respiration, the mutant doesn't grow as well in the gut. However, if you do this experiment in germ-free mice, recover both bacteria, the wild-type and the mutant, in equal numbers. 
Totally. I should say this this kind of experiments, this competition experiments, are relatively new in the business. Traditionally, one studied one bacterium at a time, but this ability to look at two organisms at the same time is really fabulous. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. a great way and to do it. And then with and without the background microbiota, yes, it's really it's perfect, um, sophisticated. It's mm-hmm. lovely. Yeah. Okay, so so far uh, we we think anaerobic. Uh, respiration is important. Now, they also happen to notice when they're doing their experiments that nitric oxide synthase is induced in the colon of mice infected with citrobacter. Now, this is an enzyme that makes nitric oxide, as the name says. It's a host response to infection. So they're, they're wondering if the citrobacter can use nitrate for respiration as an electron acceptor. So they knock out the genes in citrobacter encoding nitrate reductases, but this has no effect on the ability of the bacterium to grow. So negative result, we'll forget about that. It doesn't involve nitrate. But they had to investigate it because the nitrate was induced in the gut during an infection. Now, this experiment we just, we previously talked about, the citrobacter mutant that can't make molybdopterin. Unfortunately, that has two possibilities to explain the phenotype. One is that anaerobic respiration is involved, but the other is that uh, there, there could be utilization of formic acid or formate as an electron donor because the enzymes involved in this process also use molybdopterin. Okay. So it could either be uh, an acceptor, a non-oxygen acceptor involved or formate electron donor. So to address this, they make mutants of citrobacter uh, and they, they not, they disrupt two genes, which encode formate dehydrogenases. One of these couples electron transfer to nitrate and the other couple's electron transfer to oxygen. All right, so we're trying to decide whether disrupting the production of molybdopterin is involved in accepting electrons to a non-oxygen recipient or donating electrons from formate. So they uh, disrupt two genes, uh, two formate dehydrogenases. Inactivation of the nitrate-dependent dehydrogenase doesn't reduce growth of citrobacter, but Inactivation of the oxygen-dependent formate dehydrogenase reduced the fitness of, bac- of citrobacter in conventional but not germ-free mice. So that's the phenotype that we're looking for here. In other words, it looks like citrobacter is using oxygen as the terminal acceptor in the lumen. In other words, aerobic respiration. This is funny because it's the opposite of what they were thinking in the beginning, but this is where the data are leading. So how does the air get there? We're going to talk about that. There's not a lot of air in the gut. No, it's it's very, very. And I say it's extremely limiting. In fact, Michael, you know, in the end, this is a battle for oxygen. Oh, yes. (laughs) Not only is there a battle for iron, there's a battle for oxygen. So to test this idea that the bacterium is using aerobic respiration, they delete citrobacter genes encoding cytochrome B deoxygase, which is an enzyme needed for aerobic respiration. In microaerobic environments, that is where there's not a lot of oxygen, a little bit of oxygen. Now, in vitro, outside of the mouse, this mutant doesn't do well versus wild type in conditions of low or normal oxygen. But in anaerobic conditions, it does just fine, which makes perfect sense. So they co-infect mice with these these mutants, again, deleted for cytochrome B deoxidase they, with wild type citrobacter. They recover them after infection. And far more wild-type citrobacter are recovered in these co-infection experiments. In other words, aerobic respiration contributes to the growth of citrobacter in the gut of mice. Okay, so that is an interesting twist. Let's figure out what's going on. Now, first they say, we know that salmonella intestinal infection and inflammation leads to the depletion of clostridia in the gut, and that causes increased epithelial oxygenation. So they ask, does the same thing happen in mice infected with citrobacter? So they do their infections, they withdraw the contents of the colon, and they do 16S ribosomal RNA sequencing to study the community structure. The bottom line is there are increases in Enterobacteriaceae and Erythrobacteriaceae, but Clostridia actually increase in abundance. So that hypothesis isn't correct. And the next thing they look at is the effect of citrobacter to the colon epithelial cells. Now, as we said before, the attachment of citrobacter to the colonocytes depends on the type 3 secretion system, and it depends on intamin. So they deleted 
uh, the Citrobacter genes needed for the production of either T the type three secretion system or Intamin. Either strain loses the fitness advantage provided by this cytochrome uh, BD, the aerobic respiration cytochrome, at seven days after infection. However, at three days after infection, when inflammation is just developing, inactivation of the type 3 secretion system does not reduce the fitness advantage. So the results suggest that access to oxygen doesn't re actually require attachment. Because remember, we've knocked out the attachment ability of these strains, but something else produced or caused by the type 3 secretion system. So it's not simply attachment. Now, when uh, let's talk a little bit about colonocytes. Colonocytes, the cells lining your large intestine surface, they absorb, one of their functions is to absorb water from the lumen of the colon, right? So by the time digested food is reached there, it's very wet. The last thing that happens is water is removed before it, it passes from the colon. And this process requires oxygen. And that's why the surface of your large bowel mucosa is hypoxic, very low oxygen concentration. And what they find by methods that we won't get into is that when they infect mice with citrobacter, the result is a substantial reduction of hypoxia. In other words, in some way, the oxygen levels of the surface of the colonic mucosa increases by seven days after infection. And this increase this reversal of hypoxia, if you will, depends on the type 3 secretion system. So that's a really interesting uh, finding. So how does it happen? How does this type 3 secretion system of Citrobacter rodentia increase epithelial oxygenation? So that's your question, Michael. So normally the mucosa is hypoxic because the oxygen is used to uh, absorb in a mitochondrial dependent process to absorb, absorb water. So what they do is they think that damage caused by the citrobacter is involved. So they delete three genes of citrobacter that are known to cause damage of two colonocytes during infection. These, these genes were previously identified. They have a triple mutant now, which causes much less uh, intestinal cell damage than the wild type. When they infect mice with this triple mutant, they have reduced fitness advantage conferred by cytochrome BD dependent respiration. In other words, if the citrobacter can't damage the colonic epithelium, it can't replicate very well compared to wild type. So the idea is that the bacterium grows in the uh, large colon, it attaches and causes damage to the colonocytes. The host responds with a repair response, makes more colonocytes, rapid division of precursors and it makes a lot of undifferentiated colonocytes and that's what causes this this so-called crypt hyperplasia too many cells uh, in the crypt of the of the large colon these immature dividing cells now they're they're multiplying very rapidly these are host cells they make energy in a different way from resting cells they ferment glucose to lactic acid this is called warburg metabolism it's a common right. common feature of cancer cells that are replicating like crazy. They ferment glucose to lactate, and that does not consume oxygen. Correct, because it's making lactate. That's right. So they think this is how Citrobacter reverses the hypoxia on the surface of the colon. By inducing this damage, the host responds by making a lot of cell division, and that uh, produces... It doesn't use oxygen, so the oxygen accumulates. So Citrobacter reverses the hypoxia, and that fuels its growth. And in fact, the last, the last experiments they do, they find that the triple mutant, again, this triple Citrobacter mutant that doesn't damage uh, the host cell epithelium, makes less crypt hyperplasia, and there's increased epithelial hypoxia in mice infected with that, with that triple mutant. And mm -hmm. what I think is the key experiment... They infect mice with a mixture of wild type and the cytochrome BD mutant. And that mutant, remember, can't do aerobic respiration. And then they treat with a drug called dibenzazepine. This is an inhibitor of colonic crypt hyperplasia. 
That was an awesome tool to have. Isn't that great? I mean, oh, it's yeah. just what you would want, right? Absolutely. And in this experiment, the fitness advantage conferred by the cytochrome BD genes is blocked by the drug. So in other words, crypt hyperplasia is a driver of aerobic citrobacter expansion. I would have felt like a genius if I'd gotten that result. <laughs> well, that's why this goes back to why you have to know the Emden Meyerhoff pathway. You have to know <laughs> the, right. the key <laughs> choke points in the Krebs cycle, and you have to know about ox oxygen intermediates and membrane inhibitors and all of these things that were developed in the 50s and the 60s to decipher metabolism that are now sort of glossed over. These reagents were essential for teasing this part. Yeah. And yep. what what I found most fascinating about this, I read this paper on the plane flying back yesterday and the poor guy next to me because I was so excited as I was reading it, I'm going, this this is because we interviewed the senior author on TWIM a while back at a meeting, I think, Vincent, yeah, uh, was... when he introduced us to the salmonella and the thiosulfate. Yep. And, if, and as I was reading this, I'm having this tremendous deja vu to that TWIM because it's different molecules, but it's the same principles. It's all right. about redox right. balance and how these pathogens – are carving out this protected hunting preserve and enhancing their fitness while inhibiting everybody else who's there. Yeah, yeah it's brilliant. This is not the first time, as, as Michael oh, pointed no. out. The tetrathionate story that we covered is just as remarkable. These are really stunning papers because of their simplicity. They simply say... Pay attention, like you say, pay attention to intermediate central metabolism and you'll get answers that you never suspected. It's really magnificent. It's also worth pointing I'm, I'm out that you could, never, you, you could never get this, uh, break open this story just using tissue culture dishes. Mm. You absolutely, oh, yeah. absolutely. need yeah. the, the right. living gut tissue to change the oxygen environment and, and then their ability to mi manipulate the microbiota, also to delete knock out particular physiological pathways, either genetically or pharmacologically. It's just amazing the tools they brought. In fact, they point out in the discussion that this was never figured out before because people were doing experiments in Petri dishes where there's too much right. oxygen. Yeah, right. and if, if you really want to decipher this, just take figure one and figure two by themselves and sit down with your students and walk them through the experiments and ask them a simple question. What is this experiment asking and how are they demonstrating? How do you know and how do you show? If you look at figure mm -hmm. one and figure two and You're just right. take the figure legends and ask the simple question, how do you know and how did they show? You'll understand this really elegant paper and it drives home home the fact of why do we have to know the Krebs cycle? It just drives this point home that you have to be conversational with central metabolism in the modern area of microbiology. You, you wouldn't have been able to do this with uh, knockouts and molecular tools. You, you needed the whole animal. You needed metabolism in order to figure this out. Yeah, so microbiologist has progressed. When I was a student, they taught us these cycles, but we didn't quite know the relevance of them uh, to pathogens. Nobody put them together. And then the tools subsequently were developed to do the kinds of experiments in this paper, you know, knockouts and, and sequencing and colony uh, community structures. And now it comes together and, and, everything, and it makes great sense. Well, we were very excited by what the developments in understanding the biochemistry of macromolecules and the micromolecules got left behind. Right. And now we're seeing the resurrection. Yeah, and if we could just tie this back to Fred Neinhardt, I think um, this paper beautifully illustrates why we need to continually invest in basic uh, physiological uh, processes in bacteria For because sure. you can't understand infectious disease without that. Yep. So hopefully the pathogenesis field is going to shine a bright light on our need to invest more in uh, basic science, bacterial physiology. So to summarize this, type 3 secretion system encoded by citrobacter causes damage, something encoded in it causes damage to colonic cells. The host responds by producing more cells that 
ferment and you increase oxygen levels and the oxygen fuels citrobacter aerobic growth. And normally the surface of the enterocyte is hypoxic, low oxygen, and citrobacter can't compete well with other bacteria in the colon. So when you get a lot of oxygen there, it then can compete and outgrow them. So that's the battle for oxygen. Just beautiful. I was fortunate to talk uh, with our first author of this paper, Chris Lopez, um, yesterday. He did this work as a PhD student in Andreas's lab. He told me that he um, grew up with pets. He had dogs, also reptiles and amphibians. And so he had an early interest in veterinary medicine and especially exotic animals. So when he started as an undergrad at UC Davis, he majored in animal science with every intention of, of going into veterinary medicine. That didn't work out so well because he couldn't get the experience that he needed with exotic animals in order to be competitive for veterinary school. But fortunately, Dr. Russ Hovey was his mentor in the Department of Animal Science at UC Davis. And and, um, Dr. Hovey pointed out that and helped um, Chris understand that what he really loved about the field was the unknown that he really had a desire to understand the mysteries and to, and to get at mechanism. So Dr. Hovey encouraged uh, Chris to instead apply for a PhD program, which is what he did. So he was interested in Andreas's lab because of their infectious disease expertise, but also he said when he first visited the lab and met with people, he was really drawn by the lab culture. There was a lot of chatter. People were friendly. They were excited about their science, and he just wanted to be a part of it. So if you look at Chris's CV, you would think that he just leads a charmed a charmed life. I can tell you that he has not only this first author science paper, but also a first author papers in I and I and Mbio, and he contributed to six other papers in the Bomber Lab, and also was a first wow. author on a review and two reviews. So you you get the feeling that this guy, oh, everything he touches works. Well, let me just tell the students out there who are listening: this was not the case. This project, Chris admitted was really quite challenging. He had to learn how to make mutants in Citrobacter, which was difficult. The first mutants he made affected nitrate metabolism. They were directly testing the paradigm that they had established previously in Salmonella. He got a negative result. That kind of put this project on the back burner for a while. He, meanwhile, was studying Salmonella and other pathways, came back to it a few times, assembled what they thought was a a pretty good paper, submitted it to science, and it was editorially rejected, which is they didn't even send it out for review. So that was a real setback. But what the reviewers wanted, they wanted some difficult things, including like, can you measure oxygen in the tissue for us, which technically (laughs) they just could not do. But they also had a number of other smart insights that that motivated the lab to to go back and, and to do some more experiments. Even so, the the project would have stalled out if it hadn't been for another student in the lab, Fabian Rivera, who had found a paper that reported using um, hypoxia probe, this um, imaging method to go in and get a a read on on how much oxygen is in a tissue at a particular time. So it was Fabian's um, insight that uh, was key to get this project uh, moving again. Um, Chris also mentioned that he was incredibly lucky to have Brittany Miller, a new student in the lab, join forces with him and help tackle some of the um, experiments that the reviewers had uh, recommended that they do. And then also Kristen Loken in the lab was another PhD, a PhD student with Renee Solis, who is a a longtime collaborator with um, Andreas Balmer and they're also life partners. But Kristen had expertise in flow, flow cytometry, which allowed them to independently put quantitative um, data together on the oxygen impact um, on this interaction. So the fact that he had great colleagues in the lab, they all got along great, and they had different expertise, were thinking hard about the problem, and that eventually elevated this project. They resubmitted it to science and were able to publish it in this in this beautiful work. He absolutely is delighted that he joined that lab. He said his first impression of the collegiality held true. In fact, he points out that Kristen Loken, who helped with the flow cytometry, actually became 
one of the best friends of Chris's wife, who's a banker, not a scientist, and was actually the maid of honor at their wedding. And a number of other lab members were um, stood up for them at their wedding. So I think this goes to show that, that the myth that scientists are solitary creatures and just have the blinders on and they're not very social is ac- absolutely wrong. I think to be successful in science, as Chris has clearly shown, you've got to be able to interact and communicate with others. And um, yeah, collegiality is, is huge to the success of labs. So um, Chris, since September, um, is now a postdoc with Eric Scar at Vanderbilt. Uh, We've talked about work from Eric's lab in the past. Um, He's got great tools to study um, metals and nutritional metals, in particular in the context of host pathogen interactions. So Chris is now working on the biology of Clostridium difficile and its response to nutritional metals in vivo in mouse models. Also, just add that Sebastian Winter, one of the other authors on this paper, um, had been a, a member of Andreas's lab, and he is the person that taught Chris how to work with Citrobacter, and Sebastian now has his own group down at UT Southwestern. So a great um, team effort uh, led by Chris. Lovely. Thank you. Yeah. And a lovely paper. Absolutely mm. a lovely paper. Great work. Uh, Elio, do you want to leave now? Yes, if I, if I can. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Bye-bye. This episode is sponsored by Drobo, a family of safe, expandable, simple-to-use storage arrays that are designed to protect your important data forever. Now, Drobos are storage units with a number of bays, five bays or eight bays or 12 bays, and you put drives into these bays. You connect them to your Mac or to your Windows machine by a Thunderbolt or USB 3. And you can put your files on them and they'll be safe. They'll be safe for a long, long time. They're designed to, to protect your important data forever. No other storage array is such, such a high goal for itself. But why? Why is, why is it unique? It's not biology, so we can ask why questions. Drobo's founder lost pictures of his honeymoon. We're stored on a RAID 1 system, which uses mirroring for data protection. And the best he could figure out was that the drive that he stored images on slowly developed data corruption as the drive media failed. And these bad data were mirrored to the other drive. He tried to find better consumer level RAID systems. He was horrified at their complexity. So he, this sparked his entrepreneurial instincts and a new company was born. Drobo feature set has three key premises. First, your data are protected. You're protected against the drive failure. Uh, For example, if a drive fails, you simply take it out and put a new one in and all the data are replicated from the other drives. If power happens to go out when you're saving something to the drive, there's actually a battery backup cache that'll restore any last minute data there. How long will this data stay there forever? And you have to be able to add more capacity because you're always making more and more files. And so you can just add bigger drives as you run out of capacity. And it's simple to use. There are lights on the front in next to each drive slot that tell you what's going on with the drives. If they're green, they have plenty of room. If they're yellow, they're getting full. And if they're red, they're full and you have to replace them. You just take the drive out. You put a bigger capacity drive in. You could start with five, two terabyte drives. And then when it, when they fill up, you could slip in a, a three, one, three terabyte drive. And then when that fills up, you can slip in another one and so forth. Drives just keep getting bigger. So you can do that for a long time. When the, re- when the light flashes red next to the drive, it means the drive has failed. All drives will fail eventually. They're mechanical, even solid-state drives, which, by the way, you could use in a Drobo. They can fail as well. When they do, you simply take the failed drive out. Again, the, the light's flashing red. You put a new one in. All the data are replicated. They're safe, simple to use. Keep your data safe. Just works. Microbe TV listeners can save $100 off of their purchase of a Drobo 5D, 5DT, 5N, or any 8 or 12 drive system, go to drobostore.com and use the discount code microbe100. We thank Drobo for their support of TWIM. I love Drobos. I have a bunch of them here in the lab at home. Uh, I think they're great. I think they're a great product, and I'm very happy to have them as a sponsor. So we have just two emails that I'd like to read to you. It's too bad Elio left because the first one, is really cool, and he would appreciate it. It's from Daniel, who writes, Hello, long-time listener, first-time writer. It has been far too long for me to offer my sincere gratitude for the podcast. Some years ago, I was a welder working a very boring job, 
and I managed to get through my day by listening to podcasts and lectures. These podcasts and lectures convinced me to give up my boring day job and go to the excitement of university. There, I progressed in biochemistry and developed a love for science and went on to a master's, and I'm now working on my PhD. You can't imagine the excitement and fulfillment when I heard our paper was featured on your podcast, that one about diderms and monoderms, all wow. that which we did last time, right? Yeah. All that work seems to have paid off, and it truly feels like I am a real scientist now. So thank you. I feel I need to give a shout out to my PhD program. The Pasteur Institute has an international PhD program where they call for applicants every year and provide an amazing three-year PhD program. This institute is probably one of the best for doing science, and I couldn't picture a better PhD. And he gives a link to the Pasteur doctoral programs. As for our paper, thanks for the nice overview. To address Dr. Schechter's comments about seeing how the systems compare between E. coli and the negativicutes, I have this for you. First of all, remember, E. coli is one of the most evolved bacteria there is. They have a large genome and incredibly complex systems. Probably not the best model system due to that, but that's history. See the attached tree, and he provides a, a image of a phylogenetic tree. It's pretty rough, so don't make a big deal about the deep nodes. Monoderm phyla in gray, no root, so don't pay attention to what is ancient. The negativicutes are so extremely distant that it is amazing they possess the same systems in any genomic syntony. However, with the pili, some supplemental figures in the paper, it is clearly the same system. The BAM-TAM system is drastically different and matches the more closely related fusobacteria and other terabacteria beautifully. We have a lot more to say on this story, and we will have more fun articles in the coming months. Cheers, Daniel Poppleton. Isn't that lovely? As it happens, I, it is. And I actually got an um, email from uh, Christoph, one of the senior authors on this paper, mm -hmm. who's currently looking for a postdoc. So he's got that advertised. Anybody who's interested in pursuing that work and living in Paris and working at the famous, amazing Pasteur Institute should look it up. Nice. <laughs> well, um, Daniel is the second author. Now, they have some numbers and stars. Yes, yeah, so the, the first and second author, Luisa Antunes and Daniel Poppleton, says these authors contributed equally to this work. So that's pretty cool that uh, he was a welder. And uh, listen to podcasts and got into a PhD program. I think this is just a great, great story, which we hear now and then. And I, I think this is one of the best things we can do here uh, with our podcasts. It's just Yeah, great. thanks so much, Daniel, for sharing that. <clears throat> yep. It's, again, curiosity. He curiosity. was curious and, you know, he he just goes into it and, you know, it, the, his life is forever changed. Yep. Sure is in a good way. All right, we have one more email from Anthony who sends us a really interesting article and in, just published in PNAS, Climate Influence on Vibrio and Associated Human Diseases During the Past Half Century in the Coastal North Atlantic. And basically, this is all about climate change and its effect on bacterial communities. In this study, they provide experimental evidence on the link between climactic variability in the temperate North Atlantic and the presence and spread of Vibrios, which of course are responsible for infections in humans and animals. They use archived formalin preserved plankton samples conducted over the past half century from 1958 to 2011. They use those to assess the abundance of vibrios, including human pathogens, in nine areas of the North Atlantic and North Sea, and they show correlation with climate and plankton changes. Uh, generalized models revealed that long term increase in vibrio abundance is promoted by increasing sea surface temperatures and is positively correlated with the Northern Hemisphere temperature and the Atlantic multi-decadal multi oscillation climactic indices. Such in increases are associated with an unprecedented occurrence of environmentally acquired vibrio infections in the human population of Northern Europe and the Atlantic coast of the U.S. in recent years. Pretty cool stuff. Another example of the effects of climate change. Yeah, and another one that's on our minds is uh, mosquitoes and, oh, yes, and sure. how their range is changing and the viruses like Zika and Dengue and West Nile that they bring with them. For sure, the mosquito range is increasing. And uh, I, was just, I was talking to someone yesterday, and, and you know, right now 80s Egypti in the U.S. has a limited range, but maybe one day it'll be throughout the U.S. Who knows when it gets so mm. warm. 
Well, that was the only good news about the storm. Yeah. They think that the hurricane will literally have arrested Zika transmission in Florida simply because the amount of, of rain that, that happened and the wind probably killed a large number mm. of the adults and the flooding and all the associated things that were a consequence of the storm will probably arrest this last bit of the mosquito season. Mm-hmm. So we're keeping our fingers crossed and we're waiting patiently for public health to continue doing their mosquito census, looking for Zika to hopefully that uh, modeling result will bear fruit. It's interesting. We had on TWIV last week, two people from Florida Gulf Coast University who were involved in looking for Zika in mosquitoes from Miami-Dade. And I asked them that question and they said, well, we don't know what the effect of the hurricane was going to be. In fact, as I was talking to them, the hurricane was blowing through Although on the West Coast, of course, it was a lot less severe. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that's an interesting point. We'll see in the next few weeks what happens. Yeah. So I'm teaching a uh, freshman course, Current Topics in Microbiology, and we just did West Nile virus, Mm -hmm. which um, is a great model system because we've got an extra 10 years of data. And my understanding there is that these heavy rains in that case will wash away a lot of the um, mosquito larvae Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. that they do see that it then reduces um, disease in the next season. And that's that's what the the public health guy specifically cited Michelle's example of the data on West Nile. That's what they were using to make that. As a paradigm. Yeah, Yeah. as a paradigm. And I understand a hurricane or high winds can also redistribute mosquitoes. To places where, right. they, where they weren't previously. So you, you yeah, have so, to see. So predicting how climate change is going to affect any one infectious disease is really complicated. Yes, yes. Of course, if you have data like this paper on the Vibrios, it helps a lot. Right. I want to tell you about the ASM grant writing online course, which provides an overview of the NIH and NSF grant process. This is an online a webinar sponsored by ASM. Topics include a broad overview of the grant writing enterprise, writing NIH and NSF biosketches, and viewing grants from the reviewer's perspective. It's a six-part series taking place from January through March of 2017, and you can do it from your home or lab or office. It's a webinar. It's online. There's a registration deadline. You have to register for this. It's February 10th. You can learn more at bit.ly slash ASMG. WOC 17. So it's ASM and GWOC stands for Grant Writing Online Course 17. And, and the fee for ASM members is really quite low. It's all, it's $150, which is about the price of a textbook, I would say. So if any student out there is interested, I would go to the head of your graduate program and ask them to fund you to take this course. Yep, <laughs> you bet. A little bit of groveling never hurts. (laughs) $150 is just not that much when you think about the expense of of laboratory research and tuition. and It's a great value. And that's TWIM 137. You can find it at iTunes, and you can also find it at microbe.tv slash TWIM. Consider becoming a patron of TWIM and all the family of science shows we do at Microbe TV. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute to find the different options there are for that. We love getting your questions and comments. Send them to twim at microbe.tv. Elio Schechter, of course, who uh, had to leave early, is at Small Things Considered. Michelle Swanson is at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Michael Schmidt is at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Vince. And you have survived. We're glad to hear that. I am I am glad to survive. I wasn't looking forward to dealing with contractors. <laughs> I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM, and Chris Kandian and Ray Ortega for their technical help. I also want to thank the sponsors of this episode, Curiosity Stream and Drobo. The music you hear on TWIM is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkies. You can find his work at ronaldjenkies.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. Thank you.